we'll be having two talks today. The first talk will be conducted by Aravind, who will be speaking to you about using AI and the metaverse to lend spacecrafts on Mars. Aravind is the co-founder and CTO at ByteFrost. He's focused on building products that make a difference. He also describes himself as a meme dealer. So let's welcome him. Brilliant. Um, so just some very quick introductions. I came from um, a deep AI background. So I did a lot of research in academia. Um, it was fun. However, it didn't quite um, satiate the need to like build some real stuff in the real world. So I went on to work at a startup and what they were doing at the startup was, if you take a picture of your iris using a camera phone, it will tell you your level of diabetes and whether there's a chance of you going blind. And at the exact same time, ironically, Google was doing the same thing for the same users in India. So you know, a lot of the VCs at that point of time didn't really want to bet against Google. But the fun fact was um, Google, I think like five months later, they announced that they couldn't actually build it because it was too hard a problem. And that same month, we actually published uh, an awesome clinical study proving that we got 98% accuracy. And that got me thinking like, hey, even the world's top AI engineers are having trouble building and shipping real world AI deployments. Maybe there's a chance to rewrite the book on how AI is being built in actual real world scenarios, which is why we started Bifrost and we're bringing this capability to more of the world's top organizations and companies. So today, I'm just gonna cover three main things, which is in general, what is this problem that the AI industry is currently facing when they want to build AI for the real world and not just for like research and how virtual worlds can actually help build a better AI workflow. And the last one is, you know, how is this workflow being used by NASA to land spacecrafts? So NASA is one of our clients and they're using this workflow to help with their precision landing systems for Mars. Right. Um, so I think the, uh, the biggest thing about building AI in today's day and age is actually not so much the models, because the models are actually good enough. You can literally just download faster RCM and all your little and you're off to the races. The, the tricky part is really actually building your data set. And that's actually the hardest part to acquire because you're bottlenecked by the real world. You're bottlenecked by how fast you can collect data, what types of data you can collect. So like, for example, if you're a self-driving car company, you literally need to have an entire suite of vehicles collecting data 24 seven across multiple time zones, across multiple regions. And once you have that insane amount of data, you need to then sort through everything. So this ends up taking like years to build a good data set. So like companies like Motional and Autonomy in Singapore, they take a very long time to build data sets. And the second biggest thing is actually, after you've collected all the data, sometimes it ends up being very, very biased. Um, I'm sure a lot of us have seen like, you know, biased AI where AI is biased towards um, the white demographic simply because it was collected in Massachusetts of United States in Boston, for example. And oftentimes, this, oftentimes it leads to poor performance and a lot of failures when it's actually been deployed, some of which I'll show later. And the last one, I think the most important one is when it comes down to the most important and critical use cases, like self-driving, for example, it's extremely hard to get rare and critical data of like, for example, um, a bicycle attached to a car while it's driving. So the AI network will just see a bicycle and be like, oh, there's a cyclist right in front of you, so you should stop your car. But it's actually someone who's driving a car with a bicycle attached to the back. So those kinds of very weird AI signals throw off the network. And as a result, a lot of the time you have AI related mishaps and crashes. So like the most famous one is Tesla, which is for three years straight, it failed on the same scenario, which was there was a white truck on a white horizon line and it wasn't able to detect the white truck. So it didn't slow down. So it just accelerated and it killed the driver in the process, right? So, there's this weird, very weird thing that happens in like AI workflow, which is step one, you collect the data, you quality check the data, you curate it, you label it, you train, and then you test your model. But the tricky part is that 
your whole process is actually so dependent on the data, but the developers have no control over the data because someone else collects all the data and then someone else labels the data and the AI developers just get a data set that they have to play with. So what they end up doing is a lot of times they try to improve on the hyperparameters, they try to improve on the model architectures because they treat it as a static object that they can't really change. And even if they wanted to request the new data, it takes about a few months for a turnaround time. I'm just like, okay, it turns out my models are performing really well on nighttime scenes for this specific ambulance vehicle. How are you going to get that kind of data at scale? Which is like, how I can how can I get hundred thousand images of an ambulance at a wide intersection? Besides actually hiring an ambulance and driving it around and getting that data. As a result, you know, popular data sets like ImageNet, they took more than two years to sort and label, excluding data collection because how they actually built it was just data mining Google searches. And they just sorted and labeled it from there. So this is a very interesting use case, which is, this is a prime example of how AI models fail due to like the, the failure and the content of the data. So in the real world, you have a diversity of like environmental conditions, which is like, you got clear skies, you got cloudy weather, you got rainy weather, you got snowy weather. But what ends up happening is a lot of people, they just collect the data for one specific type of condition, which is, oh, let me get all the data for clear skies and let me train my model on that. And when they go into the real world and they test it, they also test it on the clear skies only. But when you actually deploy it and it goes through the whole seasonal changes, it just starts to fail miserably because it can't deal with clouds and rain and snow, which it hasn't seen before. So basically you can see the same geographic spot, but two very different images. And the model isn't able to generalize basically. Another big common problem we see with a lot of the industry is um, because a lot of the labels are crowdsourced, you get a lot of weird labels because people are just doing it very, very quickly and they are sorting through millions of images. So one image may be a few seconds. So you get things like labeling this as a water bottle or labeling this bus as a passenger car. And you can see how the model then is able to actually guess it correctly, but the labels are wrong. So it leads to bad performance because you're telling the model, hey, this is actually a water bottle when in fact it's not. The errors also aren't so obvious sometimes, which is on the left, um, this is a satellite image of containers. And what's actually happening is, technically you're supposed to label every single container, but the human labeler just went in and labeled containers with a very inconsistent manner. So the model then begins to see containers in a lot of different forms and formats. It cannot form a consistent model of what it is in its head that when it learns, there's so much variety that it does not perform very well. And this is on a popular data set called XV. On the other hand, it's like a very simple example of a fox. There are so many ways of drawing a bounding box that it affects your, like your ILU thresholds a lot as well. Because one could be just training to detect the face and the upper body, while the other is like for a full body a detection. And this is like, you know, it's even the human labels even label where they think the body should be, which is wrong. Instead, it should be only the features which the model should be learned. So, you know, how exactly does virtual worlds come in? How exactly do virtual worlds help the scenario? So what we do at Bifrost is we use virtual worlds, we simulate real world conditions, we simulate reality, and we have this pocket wall in which we can go in and we can just collect and create data at scale. So instead of months, you can generate data sets in minutes for whatever use case you want. And in this case, it's picturing a city that we generated for a client. And it's all using our tool to generate the city and then get the pixel perfect labels for every single building and road in the city. All right. So what this allows users to do is they can get their data fast and it's all perfectly labeled and you have a very, very quick turnaround time. And more importantly, you have diverse data because it's no longer biased. You can control everything from the distributions to simulating a variety of scenarios. And the last part being, 
you get to control the data, which is something developers previously did not have, right? They couldn't just say, okay, let me try generating nighttime imagery of this vehicle at this specific angle. Simply because you couldn't just go out into the real world and command that kind of data. But now you can with this approach, which is just using virtual worlds. And this approach is nothing new. Um, you know, people, researchers first started off using GTA to try and train self-driving cars. It's just over the years, people have developed new techniques to make training on virtual worlds better and better and better. And today with the culmination of GPUs, plus photorealistic rendering, plus all these advances in compute, we finally are at the stage where this can become scalable. So for example, all the users to do is just say, okay, I want um, the environment to be like San Francisco Bay, I want a sunny day, I want an aircraft carrier, I want there to be five inches of the aircraft carrier, and I want it from an aerial view. And the engine just generates a whole bunch of imagery for you to train on. Right, so you no longer have to go through that whole process and you're no longer bottlenecked by the real world. Instead, you just generate your data, train, test, and wherever it's failing, you just generate new data to patch that whole basically. So like, if it's failing on cloudy weather, just generate more cloudy weather. If it's failing on cars that are chrome in color and extremely shiny, and you can just generate that kind of data and then chuck into your data set. And then now you can redistribute your distributions within your data set. So it becomes a lot like bug fixing and a lot closer to software development simply because you can do it procedurally as opposed to just trying to pull various hyperparameters in search of better performing model. So an interesting thing was that our AI, our, our, one of our interns, he used this tool and this approach and he managed to beat like a state-of-the-art AI benchmark in a week. And his approach was quite simple, right? Which is you generate a baseline data set, you find out where it's failing, and then you change the distributions on the tool end in order to build a more diverse and representative data set. So like it's things like changing the camera elevation, which is the angle. It's about adding specific 3D objects. And because of that, he managed to beat the state of the art. We published a blog post about it. If you want to read more details, you can check that out. And more importantly, we think that AI shouldn't be limited to what humans can do. Um, you know, like humans are really good at drawing bounding boxes very, very quickly. But if it was to be like, label every single blade of grass in a time sequence data, so like in a, in a video sequence, it becomes really, really tricky. So this was one project we did for DARPA and they are building an off-road autonomous vehicle. And we built out the entire stack for labeling the entire shrubbery, trees, rocks, and terrain, all synthetically, right? So I'm just gonna quickly go into how exactly this is being used for spacecraft landing. So the main objective being, um, how do you land uh, autonomous systems on Mars using um, synthetic data? So this is an example of like Martian terrain. And as you can probably guess, it's very, very varied in terms of like rock distribution, sand, terrain, slopes and hills, and all the kind of different terrain and geographical features. It's very hard to use classical robotics here, simply because there's so many things that are happening all at once. Um, the other thing is using a remote approach, which is like having like a live link to the uh, robot platform and controlling it is no longer an option because the lag from here to Mars is extremely high. You can only send asynchronous commands, which is move forward, it sends the command, you wait for 10 seconds, the robot executes it and then sends back the video feed. So there needs to be some kind of onboard autonomy so that it can make decisions on the fly. And if it sees a rock or a boulder or a hill that it can't climb, it can stop before it actually proceeds. Right. So this is actually synthetic virtual worlds that we created and that the, our platform generated. Um, so these mimic the conditions of Mars. And what we're able to do is have this full 3D geometric view of every single rock 
every single um, crevice, every single slope and terrain. And from this, we're able to get like a perfectly labeled semantic representation of the scene. So we get things like, okay, what, what type of terrain type is it? Number of rocks. What is the angle of incline? What is the capture height? And from this, as the helicopter is flying, it is able to, on the sly, label everything that's seeing, and it knows where it's safe to land, where it's dangerous to land, and even sometimes where um, there is interesting features that we should like pay attention to. Right. This is a synthetic scene where it is the, the Mars rover, so the one that doesn't fly, but the one that crawls on the surface. And it just shows the pixel perfect like segmentation mask. Right. And that the whole thing that, you know, giving the NASA scientists the power to do it is really that parameterized data generation, which is testing their algorithm under different parameters, which is, oh, if I change my rock distribution, how does the model do? Oh, if I change my lighting conditions, how does that affect my model performance? And being able to do all of that without actually going to Mars and without actually having to wait for all the data to come back from Mars, it's a really, really empowering like approach. And you know, simulation has been around for a while, uh, but it wasn't really used in the visual domain as much. Uh, the cases that it was used was really, really low-fi because a lot of the time it looks like PS1 graphics or PS2 graphics. Right. And one big thing is using proceduralism. So it looks a lot more natural and is not just like one static picture texture that is repeated throughout the entire scene. Everything is photorealistic, it's nuanced, it is high in diversity. Examples of how lighting variation adds to diversity. And you know, relighting that same geometric scene under different lighting conditions once again to test stuff. An example of how like rock distribution changes. And the cool part is, you know, we can then allow the user to change the like distributions of the rock distribution in terms of like how much area is covered. So this is something that the NASA scientists use, which they call CFA, which is how much of the area is covered by how much of rock of a certain type of radius. Right, so this was something that they required. And you know, you're able to drive that procedural world generation using this. This is just some of the metadata that was used, which is you know, you have your optical image, you have your depth image, which is like your um, stereo cam, a range image, which is also like your like laser range finder, elevation map, which is like your entire terrain elevation, where all your rocks are. A roughness map basically just signifies how much of change in height there is as they go along a certain surface. And they use all these different maps to combine them in order to get a classification of whether it's safe or not safe to land. Right. So, an example of a fly through, it'll say, okay, I detected rocks of all these parts, I detected surface anomalies in all these parts. So, the actual safe areas are only this part, the rest are unsafe to land on. Right. And then at the end of the day, they compare it against how their model performs. And it's very, very close. Yeah, some other virtual worlds that our clients are using. So California Desert, some marine maritime examples for autonomous maritime vehicles. Um we are backed by we're a bunch of world-class engineers from Lucas Fields, Davidia, Google, Motional, but backed by Sequoia and Techstars. If you want an internship or you want to come join us and see what work we do, feel free to drop me an email after this. Awesome stuff. Um, yeah, that's all from my end. Questions, thoughts? What about you guys? Uh, hi. Uh, first off, thanks for the great talk. And I guess I'd just like to ask, um, what's your intuition behind why is it that synthetic data is uh, still able to train the models to um, uh, the standard that we see of models being trained in real life data, because I would still assume that there'll be still, I guess, subtle differences between synthetic data and uh, real life data. So yeah, I exactly. just like to know what's your intuition behind that. 
Yeah, so there's, there's something called like, called like the domain gap, which is, you know, you have something like, um, like a PS2 game and you have something which is a real world. If you show it to a human side by side, they'd be very clearly be able to tell the difference. The difference comes in two parts. One is photorealistic graphics become so, 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 the fidelity has increased so much that it's very indiscernible. And the second one being the pixel level artifacts, we have been able to recreate using certain style transfer approaches, which is we look at real world imagery, we train a network to identify the pixel level distributions, and then we take that and then we then apply it to the synthetic graphics. So what it's doing is that although it's imperceptible to a human, we are mimicking the distributions on a pixel level on the synthetic imagery. So we're just making it as similar as possible to real world distributions. And you know, we do the same old sensor emulation stuff, which is mimicking how light bounces off things. We're doing things like chromatic aberration, lens distortion, all that very controllable things we can do. And then on top of that, we mimic the pixel level artifacts as well. So that's like why and how it's able to perform really well. Great, thank you. Uh, hi, Arvind, uh, Khalil here. Just uh, had a quick question around, uh, I'm guessing that the compute required for generating an entire virtual world is quite a lot, right? Like, um, do you guys um, do this in the cloud and um, are the costs any, uh, like is cost a concern in that case or like the compute limit limitation or something like that? Sure. Yeah. So there are a few approaches, right? So there's the typical approach that typical companies like Lucasfilm and Pixar do, which is full path tracing. That's very, very compute uh, intensive. Our approach takes um, like a real time system. So the compute is actually not as intense as that. So we're able to generate a data set in like 10 minutes because it's a real time system as opposed to like a fully path trace system. So um, in terms of compute, it actually doesn't take a lot at this point, simply because of how powerful the GPUs have gotten and how much um, graphics algorithms has improved and how much like optimizations we're actually able to do in the graphics levels to push how fast we can compute things. And like what you said, we can split the job across multiple GPUs, so that becomes faster as well. Okay, that sounds great. And just to confirm, uh, the, the GPUs that you use are, are not on premise, they are in the cloud, right? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Awesome. We are actively looking for interns. So uh, we have quite a few interns on hand. So if anyone wants uh, to reach out, feel free to do so. Arvind at backfrost.ai. Like we just check out our website as well. And there are no further questions. Thank you, Arvind, for your very insightful talk. I really find your talk very interesting. And right now we'll, have, we'll wait for two minutes before the next speaker will set up this slide. Thank you. Gotcha. Awesome. Thanks, guys. The next talk will be conducted by Kalil, who will be sharing about food DX from zero to production. Kalil is a full stack software engineer with a preference for backend engineering and DevOps. He likes coding in Haskell and Rust and generally has a preference for functional languages with a relatively strong type system. So let's go for him. Hi, everybody. Good evening. And uh, thanks for joining today. Um, I guess um, I'll get started now. Um, I, I'll just uh, give you guys a small introduction on what I'm going to sort of talk about. Uh, and feel free to interrupt me, feel free to ask questions, pause me if uh, you didn't understand what I said, and if you want to repeat anything, all right? Um, okay, so the, the main topic for today, uh, what I'm going to talk about is FoodDX, right? This should be the the sort of the overview of what I'll be covering, which is basically an introduction to the product, um, what tech stack choices we made, how we architected it, um, and a lot of the preparations, procedures, and stuff we had to do before taking this particular product to, to production. Uh, apart from that, also the other surrounding um, procedures and uh, standard, uh, standard op operating procedures that we usually have to do for a production project. And then at, at the end, I will also just uh, sort of just talk about some takeaways that we have um, based sort of the learnings uh, that we got from this project. 
Okay, all right. Um, so what is food DX? So essentially, if you if you try to um, just have a simple definition about food DX or how it how it works is that it takes in an image as an input, and the output would be a score from one to five, and that score um, indicates how healthy the food image that you uploaded is. So it could be like um, it's indicative of um, let's say, so five would be like a really healthy meal that you can and should have every day. And a one would be more of a, oh, you should probably avoid this and keep it to once in a while. All right. Um, yeah. So if uh, if you did not really understand that, maybe I can explain it to you in the form of a meme, which is this. Okay, cool. I'll just go ahead. All right, so going forward to tech stack choices. Now at Hallmask, uh, where I work, uh, we have a very interesting uh, choice of tech stack, which is essentially um, Haskell as the default backend language. Now, a lot of you may or may not have heard of Haskell, uh, but essentially uh, it's a functional programming language with a very strong type system. Uh, what that enables us to achieve is to have a very reliable uh, service, I would say, in the sense that it is uh, quite stable and we have, uh, Haskell guarantees you referential transparency. Uh, I'm not sure if a lot of you have a mathematical focus in some of your courses, but essentially what that means is that for functions that are non-IO, that is, if it does not have any input from the outside world, um, if you have the same set of inputs, you will always get the same set of outputs, no matter how many times you run the function. All right, so that's the advantage, the main advantage of Haskell. Um, so Haskell is the default backend uh, choice of language at Hallmask. Um, but for this particular project, we also have another interesting choice here, as you can see on the bottom, which is Rust. Um, I think the main reason why we went with Rust uh, for this particular microservice, that's one of the services powering food DX, is because we couldn't do what we wanted to do for this project in Haskell, because this uh, involved taking a machine learning model and deploying it into production. And at the time where we were exploring this and we were building this uh, project, which is in around the first quarter of 2020, um, Haskell did not have good TensorFlow uh, library support. I think as of today, it does. I think the TensorFlow library has evolved in Haskell and it can support uh, what we wanted to do back then. So if we had to write this uh, pr uh, product or project again today, we might not have made, might not make the same uh, stack choices that we made back in 2020. Um, but not, not that Rust is a bad language or a bad choice. I think uh, so far what we've observed is that um, it has given us a lot of benefits. That is, it also has a lot of speed and stability associated with it. And the community um, that we, we found the Rust community to be very helpful and very uh, knowledgeable about a lot of things. All right, um, any, uh, can I just uh, maybe ask a quick question here? Have any of you in the audience um, written, any, written any Rust or Haskell before in the past? Okay, uh, I think mostly negative. Oh, yeah, we have Noel. So, uh, okay, disclaimer. Noel has actually interned at Hallmask before. Uh, and I think even apart from that, he uh, has quite a keen interest in functional programming and Haskell. Uh, so yeah, but I think apart from that, uh, most of you may not have. But anyway, uh, I'm not gonna really focus on either Haskell or Rust in this talk, but I just wanted to sort of get an idea. All right, I'll move on uh, to the architecture. All right, a lot of blocks on the screen, but essentially the main things to focus on here is that you have a pipeline here, right? So this would be, our, when, you, when you see a user here, it's, it's a representative of the client in this case. So we've integrated with uh, a client uh, system in this case. So they first upload an image to an S3 bucket. Uh, not sure if, uh, you guys are familiar? Okay, so I guess for context, at Hallmask, we use AWS a lot. So AWS is a cloud provider that provides us with things like compute, storage, um, and databases in the cloud. Uh, so an S3 bucket is nothing but just storage. So it's like, um, like you have folders and 
storage in the cloud that is really cheap and can be accessed easily via APIs, right? Um, SQS is nothing but a queue. So you can consider this as somewhat of a first in first out queue. So then an image is uploaded to this bucket and there is a notification that uh, sort of pops a message into this queue every time a new image is uploaded here, all right? Uh, from there, we have a service that looks at the queue and pops out messages from the queue, uh, processes, uh, does some processing. In this case, it would take that image. This is the core service that takes the image and outputs a score between one to five for that particular image. All right. And then it stores the result in what's called a Redis store. Um, Redis uh, is a no SQL or a very fast cache uh, caching service. Um, and essentially what it does is just stores like mapping. So for example, you would have uh, some image ID and this would be the result for it. So you can consider it to be like a less structured, faster database. All right. And then you have a polling mechanism here. So after the client has uploaded an image, they just keep polling to say, Hey, can I have the result for this particular image? And until the result is ready, uh, we'll just internally also just, uh, pull the Redis store till we have a result and then return it back to the client. All right. Um, yep. Now there was one big issue with this implementation, which is that there was a bottleneck. Uh, does anybody want to take a guess at where the bottleneck is in this system? Okay, we have one guess which says inference. Good guess, I would say. Anybody else, any other guesses? Okay, uh, I would also have guessed inference honestly, but surprisingly enough, the bottleneck was actually here. So, and honestly, I, I don't blame AWS or anybody else for this. I think it's more of a, we didn't test this enough before, before going ahead with this architecture, right? So the issue is that when an uh, object is uploaded here and there is a notification that takes it from here and pushes in the queue, there is no guarantee for this particular event hook or event trigger, right? So eventually we realized that this particular part of the entire flow takes a good, maybe 1.5 to three seconds, but this particular part of the flow takes barely between three to 500 milliseconds, right? So the order of magnitude is, this is probably like four to five times slower, right? And I think one important thing to note here is that the aim or the goal for each particular image is that it's supposed to be real time is that uh, somebody just snaps a picture of their food, sends it to us, or it's uploaded via the system and they get their food score back in about a second, right? Or less than that. So it's supposed to be nearly instantaneous, right? That's because we feel that if it's not instantaneous enough that you just uh, store your phone away and you never actually check for the result, right? So um, that was the requirement, right? So to solve this particular problem, we actually went ahead and changed the architecture. Uh, so now the new architecture that currently in production looks like this. So essentially we eliminated the bottleneck, all right? And in, so now the, the, the challenge would be that, how do you know that there's a new image uploaded so that you can go ahead and do the inference or run the inference for that particular image? So we relied on the fact that the client is pulling us for results, right? So what we do is we consider this first poll from the client as the event hook or the event trigger. The moment that poll comes in, we proxy an HTTP request to this service here, run the inference, and then send the result back. If the result does not come in a fixed amount of time, which I think is set to about 800 milliseconds, uh, we send back a message to the client saying, okay, uh, we're still processing it, it's not ready yet. And since this is a polling system, the client has a timeout where they wait for maybe another one second. They send a request again and say, hey, is it ready now? And then again, we either check, maybe do we already have the result or we send another request to ask, hey, is the result ready? And then we come back here and we have the result, we return it back. All right, um, I'll pause here for a bit. Any questions around the re-architecture or the current architecture that we have? Okay, I don't think so, but in case you have any questions, please feel free to either write it in the chat or just unmute yourself and ask, right? Cool, moving on. Uh, all right, so this is essentially the same picture that we saw in the previous slide, but a slightly zoomed out view, right? Because now we, okay, wait, do I have a question? Okay, 
Uh, Noel, uh, could you explain more on why there was a one or two second slowdown? Okay, uh, good question. I guess, sorry, one second, I may go back. So let me actually uh, show you this um, repository that we made to actually check the, the benchmarking, right? So this particular repository just uploads a lot of images to S3 and then um, waits for how long it takes to get ready in SQS, right? So essentially we, we did this um, benchmarking and then we observed that the distribution, so the range here is all in milliseconds, right? So you can see that sometimes it could even take up to seven or eight seconds. Of course, we are uploading in this uh, benchmarking a lot of images to S3. But again, we do expect a lot of load for this particular product in real life. So essentially what we realized is that there's no guarantee and the distribution is quite sort of, yeah, it's quite crazy here because essentially it could take even up to more than 10 seconds since an image is uploaded into S3 for the event to show up in SQS, all right? Um, and I think this was the essential reason for the slowdown, right? Um, I think, the root cause, if I have to tell you, would be probably just optimism on our part and not reading of the docs, right? Because if you go into the documentation, it does state very clearly that AWS does not give you a guarantee on how fast the, the delivery of the notification is from S3 to SQS. So essentially that was the issue. All right, um, thanks for the question. Um, Yep, so moving on. All right, so here we face the problem of having multiple AI models for a different market, right? For, for different regions, right? So I think this ties in a bit with um, a little bit of what Arvind had shared earlier, which is that a lot of data sets can tend to be biased, right? So the initial data set that we had to train uh, our machine learning models was very much focused in Singapore. Right. So you see at the top, there is this S3 bucket that says SG hyphen HK hyphen MY. So this is a common bucket and a common AI model that is for the regions of Singapore, Hong Kong, and Malaysia. And the reason for this is because the food that is consumed in these three regions are broadly quite similar, right? If you think about it. So what we realized is that the AI model worked pretty much quite well for if it was deployed for these, these regions. But when we go for maybe the Philippines or for Thailand, the, the food, the cuisines differ slightly or quite a bit in the sense that the accuracy drops quite a lot. So just to give you uh, an idea of the numbers, it would be like probably 90% or 94% accuracy here. And then if you use the same model for these two uh, regions, the accuracy drops significantly to like 82, 80%, maybe even slightly below 80%. So that's definitely not feasible, right? Because then you'd get really off scores. So you upload a relatively unhealthy image and you'd get a four, or you upload a healthy images and you get a healthy image and you get a three or a two. So to solve that, we have multiple services running at the same time. And depending on which S3 bucket, um, depending on which market the image is from, it's uploaded to a different S3 bucket. And based on that, we know where to send it and where to sort of proxy the HTTP request here. Um, yeah, so essentially that is the uh, broader level architecture, all right? Um, moving on to load or stress testing, all right? So now we have this system in place, everything is fine. How do we test um, how much load we can handle, right? So the initial estimated load that we were given by the client was that we would expect about 100,000 images at lunch on one day, right? Uh, I mean, there was a very, I would say, optimistic worst case estimation. Uh, till today, we haven't actually received that level of load, but that's what we had in mind when we were designing the service because you always design a service for a worst case scenario rather than a low load scenario. So essentially we, we did have to test this a lot, right? So you test how much load your system can take, right? What happens when there's too much load, right? Like different systems react in different ways, right? So for example, it could like a good case scenario is that the system just slows down and then it only processes how much it can process at a time. And then whatever is in the backlog gets processed eventually. 
it could be that the system just falls over, that the server just falls over and you you lose the, your service, it goes down until somebody goes um, manually and restarts the service or something like that, right? So you need to know how your system behaves when it breaks because I think pretty much every system is prone to breaking under the right or the wrong circumstances. And you just need to prepare for that eventuality, right? Um, at the same time, there's also a fine line between just before the system breaks or maybe about 20% of load less than that. There is a load at which it can safely run it can be performing at max capacity, but it's not yet breaking, right? So you need to know where that line is. And also, uh, like I mentioned, we run our systems in AWS, which is the cloud. So um, we, we have the advantage of horizontal scaling. Can anybody tell me what's the difference or the sort of the definitions of, not definitions, but essentially the meaning of vertical versus horizontal scaling? Yes, uh, that's the right answer, actually. So uh, thank you. Uh, vertical scaling is when you just move to uh, or you increase the resource on a single machine, right? So for example, if I have a machine with uh, maybe, uh, mm, let's talk of compute in terms of arbitrary numbers. So maybe the compute level is five and the RAM uh, is eight GB. And I feel that that's not enough. I want more compute or more resources, right? So I would take a, a single machine again, and I would just increase the compute to like eight or 10, and I would you get more RAM on that same machine. So maybe instead of eight GB RAM, I would use 16 or 32 GB RAM. So that would be vertical scaling, right? So horizontal scaling means that instead of increasing the compute of one machine, I just add another machine to the mix. So instead of having one machine with compute of five and eight GB RAM, I would have maybe three or four machines with the same configuration, right? And because we are in the cloud, this becomes quite easy because we just have to have a configuration or a sort of a set of rules in place that say, okay, I want to spawn more machines, right? I, want, I need more compute. So then you spawn more machines, it's added into the same system, and then you just have more compute. Um, yeah, which brings its own set of challenges in the sense that you need to then make sure that uh, you don't maintain state in any one of those single machines because you can see the problem that would happen if let's say an image came into the system to be rated and then it's sent to two different machines and then you don't know which one to expect the result from and so on and so forth, right? Okay, cool. I won't focus too much on that, but yeah, uh, interesting topic to read on if you have time. All right. so. Um, stress testing was quite a nightmare for me, honestly, because it really breaks things that you don't expect to break in the most random ways, right? So it could be that a lot of load is coming to your system and then there are SQL errors in a DB and you first think that, oh, that's, that's, that can't be the reason for the SQL errors, but then you investigate like further, 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 and then finally you find out, oh, that's why I got that SQL error. So essentially it breaks the system in ways that you can't imagine. And that is essentially why we do uh, load testing or stress testing, all right? Uh, just give you all a quick example of what a report looks like for, so we use uh, JMeter, Apache JMeter for load testing. Uh, what it allows you to do is essentially simulate users or simulate uh, a lot of load, right? So it essentially, gives you the ability to, to say, I want, let's say I want, uh, I want to upload um, 5,000 or 3,000 images to the system. Um, and I want there to be maybe 20 or 30 concurrent users at the same time, right? So you specify that in a, in a config file and you say which URL or which API endpoint to, to ping or to call. And then it goes ahead and runs that script or runs that test for you, right? Uh, I know there are a lot of numbers on the screen and stuff. This is just like two parts of the entire report I just pulled out, which I felt were quite interesting, right? So it shows you the latency that sort of, um, that uh, the, distribution, the distribution of latency depending on how many uh, requests, right? Uh, and here, I think this is the most important part which we wanted to focus on is that we want to make sure that the response time uh, for um, giving a food a rating is as low as possible. All times are in milliseconds here. So you can see that is not that bad at this point, which is about, I think the median is about 1.2 seconds, which I would consider to be quite decent for this use case. All right, um, moving on. Um, how do we tell? So let, let's assume that, okay, we have this service in place. We have done our load testing and everything is fine. 
Uh, now we're going to deploy in production, right? Like how do we know and how do we monitor and how do we tell that this service is up and running and working at all times, right? Um, anybody in the audience or in the crowd has used uh, serverless or AWS Lambda in the past? Or maybe you want to just tell us what it is. Okay. Uh, but it's, okay. So essentially what serverless is, is a concept where instead of having a dedicated server, for doing your computation, you you have um, a function as a service, right? So essentially, what it does is, uh, when you need to do some compute or some computation in the cloud, uh, you have an event trigger that triggers some function there. It starts up some and 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 allocates some resources for it, some compute or some resources for it. It finishes running whatever function or code you need to run, and then it shuts down. So you are charged only for that amount of compute that you have used, right? So you don't need to keep a dedicated server running at all times. And you, of course, save costs, right? Because you're charged only for the amount of compute that you have used, right? So in this case, what we do to actually test and make, make sure that our system is running at all times is we have a function that is triggered every minute. It registers an image, uploads it, fetches a score, and then shuts down, right? So it, only once it gets the score, it reports that, yes, the service is running. And that's how we know that, yes, the service is running. If it does not get a score, it throws all sorts of alerts and warnings. And the, the on-call team or the developer team is notified to see that, hey, your production service is down. All right. Mm, cool. So now in the lead up to the, so we launched this, uh, this into production in April 2021. And these are the items that we had to do in preparation for the launch, right? So we had a lot of SOPs, which is essentially like escalation levels, like something is going wrong because it's not just the tech side you have to take care of here. It's also the business side, the client side. Uh, there could be n number of things going wrong, right? So essentially, who is in charge of what uh, within the team? Um, how do you escalate an issue? Who do you escalate it to? Who is in charge of what? So on and so forth. Load testing, which I already just covered. Over provisioning. So essentially, you don't know when you're launching a new product how successful or how it's going to go, right? Like it could be that this blows up overnight and then people are like, you know, talking about it all on social media and be like, like, you know, this is some new thing, check it out. And then like things go viral all the time, right? So you just need to be aware and be uh, sort of ready for that in case that happens. Because in case your product goes viral, you don't want to be caught napping and unprepared for that scenario because that's your opportunity to strike gold. And if you lose that, it is like really not going to be good, right? Uh, in general, we also over-provision uh, infrastructure just because uh, there are spikes and also traffic could increase over time, right? Because on launch day, you may have a few number of users, but the number of users that you have usually increases over time, right? All right, so now why is cost an issue uh, in this particular uh, project's um, sort of scope, right? Uh, I think the first issue is that we, we need to use GPUs, right? I think this ties into the question that I asked Arvind earlier, which is because this is something that we've struggled with a lot for this project, which is GPU machines in the cloud are not cheap, right? Uh, and the cost adds up over time, right? Um, also, we uh, so I did not mention this earlier, but essentially the client or the customer that we in, we integrated this with is uh, EIA Vitality. You may have heard of their app. So it's a general uh, health and wellness app that you get as an add-on to your insurance by EIA. And so currently FoodDX as a service is integrated into the Vitality app. So it's quite a popular app and they do have quite a lot of users. So we had to prepare for potential large sort of uh, um, number of users using this feature. And also um, one last thing, which is very important to note here is that you know when people have food, right? So usually it's like probably in Singapore is probably between uh, 12 noon to about 1.30 PM, right? So your distribution of load is not going to be equal across the day. You're gonna have a high amount of load at around lunchtime and at about evening dinner time. And the rest of the day is probably going to be uh, relatively flattish um, sort of uh, line on that graph, right? So we do need to prepare for like ex provision extra compute infrastructure for meal timings, and that poses its own sort of set of challenges, all right? 
so here is a very interesting graph which shows you the cost that it took to run food DX around the time that we launched, right? So you see March, it was quite low because we hadn't yet launched. So we didn't have to provision that much of compute. And then April, it just shoots up. And here it's in uh, $1,000, right? So in April, it was close to about $10,000. Uh, April is when we launched this in Singapore. In May, we launched in Malaysia as well. Uh, in June, we had Hong Kong launching as well. So that's why you see it going up because a new region means more, more infrastructure being provisioned and it's a new launch. So we don't, it's the same set of concerns that you have, right? You don't know how many users are going to use the, the system. You don't know what's going to happen on launch day and after that, so on and so forth. So we just had to keep provisioning more and more infrastructure till the point where the bill for this particular product only came to about 15,000 US dollars for the month, which is, I would say, uh, we are still a startup and we are still running on funding. So that's quite a lot, right? Um, it was relatively acceptable, but then essentially um, things got like basically in July, we realized that we can't keep running and sort of paying almost 12 to 15,000 US dollars a month for this particular product, product only because it's not earning as much because this is not a paid service to the customer, right? We get some fee from the client for this, but it's not enough to justify this cost, right? Uh, so essentially what we had to do is emergency cost optimization at that point, right? Um, so then we leveraged this thing called spot instances from AWS, which is essentially um, in a cloud provider like AWS has a lot of uh, compute that is spare. So they give out this compute to clients to basically us for a lower rate with less guarantees, right? So usually when you have what's called an on-demand instance, it's yours, you know it's yours. And until you decide to terminate or shut down that instance or that, that computer, it will remain on, right? A spot instance on the other hand is more unreliable in the sense that it is your compute, it is your instance, but AWS can take back that capacity anytime they feel like or they need to, right? So in terms of spot instances, they are quite unreliable and they need to be used for fault tolerant applications. But in this case, uh, we had a directive from management to say that, okay, this product can't continue to take this much of cost. So we had to switch to using spot instances in production, which I would not recommend to anybody, but desperate times call for desperate measures. So that's what we did, right? Uh, so what, what the consequence of that was that we had to keep a close eye on all our monitors and alerts for roughly a month and a half or two months, uh, because like I said, spot instances, the capacity can be taken back by AWS at any point in time. And there's nothing you can do about it because that is the agreement that you have for using spot instances, right? Uh, fortunately, we didn't get bitten that badly uh, in this process, but sometime around November, we actually did have a production incident, incident because of this. And that's when we had a bit of a wake up call and then we optimized. Uh, so let me just show you the cost graph now. Okay. So this is what I showed you in the previous graph. And here is where we switched to using spot instances. So the cost did go, go down drastically, but the risk also went up drastically, right? And then sometime in November, we decided to really take a good look at this problem, give it, give a good shot at solving it. And we managed to solve it by actually just running the right amount of load tests, figuring out exactly how much compute we needed, and then allocating the right amount of compute for the right amount of uh, need um, in, in sort of the cloud, right? So you see the cost just goes down. And I think as of today, it costs, nearly uh, 1.8 to 2,000 US dollars a month for us, which is a big difference from something like 12 or $15,000, right? So I would say that in terms of optimizing the cost, we really did a good job, but this particular period between August to October, 2021 was not very nice, right? You can imagine because anytime your system can go down and you have to go and fix it, right? All right, um, how do we decide what to optimize and how to optimize it, right? So like I mentioned, risk is a huge factor. So usually you, would, you wouldn't go with the risky option of running spot instances in production, right? But in this case, the trade-off was that we would just have to pay money and management was not okay with that. So it was a decision from the top that do whatever you have to, just reduce the cost of this project, right? So it's emergency optimization, you don't have much choice. Uh, that's why we had to kind of forego the risk, but we also knew that we have a lot of monitors and alerts, so we will know if the system is going down. 
right? Um, incremental changes because you can't change too many things in a system uh, at the same time. You change something small, or maybe you reduce a little bit of compute, you see how the system reacts and how things go, and then you wait for a while. Because sometimes it does take time for your code to hit an edge case or your configuration to hit an edge case, right? Um, in terms of time and effort, I think that really depends from company to company and from team to team. I think uh, that one is a very specific problem, so I won't really elaborate on that right now. All right, I'll pause here for any questions around cost and load testing, if you all have anything. Seems like not, okay. Uh, so the next part of the talk will focus on how do you monitor a system and how do you get alerted if something goes wrong, right? So I think the very first building block of this is that you have an on-call team uh, composed of engineers who can deal with a production instant, right? Um, and the team, the person, there should be usually at least one to two people on call at any point of time. And if there is an incident in production, there should be a way to notify these people to say, hey, this particular service is either giving issues or showing problems, and you need to go and debug the debug or troubleshoot and uh, fix whatever it is to ensure that production is stable and working fine without a problem. All right. So the wake up in the night, that part refers to the person on call because if you're on call and even if it's 2 a.m. and there's a problem, you need to wake up and fix the problem. All right, um, cool. Uh, so how do we monitor the system, right? So let me just show you this dashboard. Um, so this is actually a live dashboard of the production system that we have uh, deployed currently. So you see a lot of different graphs and a lot of different things going on here. Usually we don't have to look at this particular page, right? But in case there's an issue, it gives you a good idea of what's happening, which part of the system is working, which part of the system is not really working. Uh, it also has things like uh, how long is a certain thing taking to run, right? So you can see the distribution over time. And this particular app that we've built, this monitoring system is called Datadog. Um, we use it for pretty much all our monitoring and logging at Hallmask. Um, so one cool feature that I just want to point out here is essentially if you hover any graph at any, so this is the graph of the last four hours. So you can see the time, which is um, eight, seven, six, and 5 PM, right? Um, so if you hover over any part of this graph, any one graph, you can see that the same point is highlighted in all the other graphs as well. So this makes it very easy to spot sometimes correlations and troubleshoot, right? So for example, if you see that at a particular point, the response times go really high, and then at the same point, you see that, okay, your database uh, CPU is spiking at the exact same times. It could be that your database instance or your compute instance is being overloaded, right? So essentially uh, you can change the time frame if you want to debug a certain point in time. Um, and yeah, so essentially the, the load that we roughly get on a daily basis for, for this particular product is about 7,000 images. This is from, all countries, which is currently um, the ones that I highlighted in the previous slide, right? Uh, you also have useful things like your database instance, how much CPU is being utilized, how much RAM is left, how many connections, um, things like network traffic. So basically it gives you the work. So in case you have any issue, this is where you come first to sort of try and see is any, are any of these metrics hitting a warning or a error, um, uh, um, indicator in the graph, right? Uh, here you can see how many HTTP 500s we've returned and uh, as expected, the number is zero because uh, 500 usually is a uh, error, a server error. So we don't have any of these fortunately. All right. Um, and in case there's any, so alerts are set up for each of these graphs that I just showed you. In case any of them crosses an unacceptable threshold, um, an alert is pushed to a Slack channel, is sent by email, and that's how the person on call is currently notified that, hey, this particular system is uh, giving issues or has, uh, has a problem right now. All right, cool, um, move on. Um, I won't focus too much on service level objectives, but essentially uh, you guys might have seen these status pages, for example, um, let's say a service you use like Slack or any other service is down. You usually have a status page that shows you the last X number of days and the status. 
So this is something similar, but since we have a client for this project, we need to maintain a, a certain level of uptime based on the contract that we have with them. So we measure this also in Datadog and um, the uptime lambda that I spoke about earlier, that essentially we use that to determine uh, how, how much uptime we had over the last X days, right? So um, I think there's just a few bumps here and there where we had some issues, but overall uh, we have uh, uptime of about 99.95, which I would say is quite decent, quite good for a product like this, right? Okay. Uh, now moving on to the takeaways and the lessons that we learned while taking this pro uh, this product to production, right? Um, always be overly prepared for anything for the worst case scenario because you would rather have extra work beforehand to prepare for a certain scenario rather than encounter it on the fly in production when there's downtime and then there's a lot of stress, right? Uh, cost planning. That's something that we didn't do for this project because if we did, then we wouldn't have had that emergency optimization uh, back in August 2021, right? So uh, cost planning definitely, I would say, is something that I would do for any future projects that we build. Uh, change of architecture. Uh, the architecture change that I showed you in about the third slide, uh, that was done after launching because we realized that the, the, the metrics were quite slow post-launch. And it was quite a headache to change architecture after a product is put into production because you have all these things like you have to inform the client, you have to ensure that there's no downtime and so on and so forth. So if you have to change your architecture, definitely pre-launch is, uh, is uh, suggested. Uh, and load testing, uh, that's the thing that we uncovered, right? In the, in the slowdown that, or the bottleneck that I spoke about is that you, it may sometimes be easy to say that, okay, uh, the overall performance of the system is so-and-so, but how do you tell which part of the system is slowing down? So in this case where you have multiple services spread over multiple, uh, even AWS services and your own servers and a microservice, it can be quite hard to tell where exactly the bottleneck is. So that I would say is a tough problem and really depends from, from system to system, but it is quite critical in determining where your bottleneck lies and where your slowdown in the system is. And the last point is something that is non-technical, but is really important to keep in mind is that in this case, uh, like I mentioned, the client is the insurance company AIA. And there was a lot of engagement that we had to do with their, with their uh, engineers, uh, their business analysts and their product managers to actually get this integration up and running and working. I think it took close to, a year and a half to actually complete the entire integration because they have a very different system from us and they have a lot of processes in place to ensure that things um, are provisioned correctly and so on and so forth. So client engagement is a non-technical part of the engineering that you do on a daily basis, but it's definitely something to keep in mind if you, if you aspire to work in sort of any engineering role and any role where you have to do an integration with a different organization, uh, you definitely need to have patience and time and energy to speak to clients. All right, um, I'll pause here for any questions around any part of this um, that I've just spoken on. Okay, it seems like there are no questions. So what I'll do is I'll just give you all a quick demo of the, so this is actually not the, the final product, but this is a website that we made internally just to demo this to clients and uh, for talks and stuff like that. So essentially um, it's as simple as you just select an image. So I'll just select a green bowl in this case, a picture that I've taken a while back. Uh, then it's uploaded, it's scored, and there you have, we have a score, right? So this is a four out of five. Uh, and here at the bottom, you have what's a food tip, which is generated on the fly based on the score that you've received. So it gives you some encouragement, some information and like sort of raising awareness about what's a good meal and stuff like that. And this is also implemented, the food tip is also implemented in the client app that we have launched. Uh, for beverages, we don't give a score, but we do recognize that a particular beverage uh, is not a food. And then accordingly give, so the result that you see here is for a beverage, and then you have an um, appropriate food tip for the same. Right, which essentially gives you some fun fact or something of that sort, right? 
and maybe uh, demo one last image. We, have, we also have a way to recognize if something that you've uploaded is not food. So I'll just upload this adapter um, that's really not a food and the X mark means it's not a food. And uh, the food tip basically gives you a questionable sort of um, response, right? Uh, probably just show you one last example, which is, uh, looks like a chicken shop if I'm not mistaken. And that also gets a four, all right? Uh, yep, so that's the demo. I think that's pretty much all I have. Yep, that's pretty much the content that I have for today. Uh, just pause quickly again if there are any last few questions. Uh, if not, we can probably find out. Okay, I have a question from Noel that is, uh, what are we using on the Rust side? Um, I don't really get the question. So is this specific to um, libraries or something like that? Yeah, okay. Uh, so we use a couple of uh, libraries that are quite famous on the Rust side. I think one of them is Tokyo, which if you worked a bit with Rust, you probably have come across. So that helps us to parallelize and batch uh, operations in the Rust code. Uh, apart from that, if I remember correctly, we also use a library for web for the web server called WARP, W-A-R-P, uh, and that essentially serves the endpoint on the Rust uh, service side. Uh, so when we call uh, any uh, HTTP, uh, make an HTTP request from the Haskell service to the Rust service, um, the WAP is used to serve those endpoints. Apart from that, I think uh, we just use the, the TensorFlow library, of course, because the machine learning models are written, are sort of so, uh, provided to us by the data science team at Hormask uh, in the TensorFlow standard format. So that's, yeah, that's pretty much about the main libraries that we use. Yeah, no question. Thank you, Kali, for a very meaningful talk. And thank you for taking your time to, to give such a talk. Yep, sure, thanks. Thanks, Ashley. And uh, I guess if any of you have any, um, I'll probably share the presentation with you guys. So you can go through it in case you have any questions and feel free to reach out to me either via Telegram or email in case you all have any follow-up questions or anything of that sort. Uh, happy to elaborate and answer. Uh, also, I'll also mention quickly that uh, Hallmask does hire interns from time to time. Uh, if any of you are interested in working with, I think, a predominantly uh, Haskell or functional programming stack. Um, but we are not uh, sort of fixed on that. We do have interns who come in and work on things like JavaScript. Uh, we have a data science team that uses Python. Uh, so if anybody is interested in uh, internship or something similar, I think we don't really have capacity for the coming summer, but we do take on sometimes depending on the candidate, uh, either part-time interns or uh, maybe for for next summer or not sure when, probably the break after next semester or something like that, yeah. So feel free to reach out and we'll be happy to connect with you. Even if you don't want an internship, maybe just to sort of maintain connections within the student community. So that will be all and thank you both to both speakers. And this will mark the last Friday hacks of the semester and see you next time. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.